And if you are a guest or a first-time visitor this morning, there is a, uh, a card right in front of you. We call it a Connect card. And it's just got some places where you can put uh, your name and your email address and some stuff like that. Uh, you don't have to fill out everything, but if you'd give us a name and an email address, we'd love to stay in touch with you. And so if you've never filled one of those out, uh, a lot of you have, but if you've never filled one of those out, uh, just fill out what you feel comfortable. And in a few minutes, we're going to pass a plate around um, to t- uh, receive our offering. And when we do that, you can just fold that up and drop it in there, and it will get to the person who it needs to go to. And you'll get a weekly email from us and uh, announcements about things going on. And so uh, with that being said, uh, in case you weren't here last week, and some of you wouldn't, uh, we started a journey last week about uh, the core values of our church and the core values are beliefs uh, that we hold so deeply that it changes the way we operate. It changes um, how we do what we do, and it's also why we do what we do. And so uh, if you want to see a whole list of the core values, you can go to the website, bombbaptist.com, and go to the About page, and you'll be able to see those. But last week we talked about the most important of our core values And that is that Jesus is central. Jesus is central. And so we believe that Jesus is the most important person in history. And as a result of that, um, he's the most important person in our church. And he's the most important person in our lives. And so the question we always want to be asking is, Jesus center of what I'm doing? Whatever we're doing, wherever we're at, we want to run everything through that filter of, is Jesus center in what I'm doing? And if he's not, then we need to uh, change the course on that. But today, uh, we're going to move on to our next core value, um, and that is that grace is greater. Grace is greater. So if you're taking notes, that's the title of the message today. Grace is greater. And so if you'll stick with me for the next 20, 25 minutes, I'm going to explain that to you. uh, But I want to pray right now to kick things off. And so, uh, Father, we come to you. Uh, God, we realize how much we need you. God, we realize that we can do nothing without you. God, we're spiritually bankrupt if it were not for you. And so, God, we rely on you, we trust in you, uh, we hope in you this morning. God, I pray over the next few moments that you'd open our hearts and our minds. God, help us to um, understand what you want to do in our lives. God, change the way we see you and the way we see ourselves. Father, I pray that today that you would overwhelm us with this truth that your grace is greater than everything in our lives. God, help us to walk away and understand that your grace is greater than whatever we face. God, we love you this morning, and it's through Jesus we pray. Amen. I want to start off uh, this talk or this message by defining grace. Defining grace, if that can even be done. Uh, But grace, the best way I can put it, is God's unmerited or undeserved favor towards us. God's unmerited or undeserved favor towards us. Grace is God showing us kindness when we deserved His wrath. Did you know that every single person in this room deserves God's wrath? Starting off on a happy note this morning. Every single person, regardless of background, regardless of age, we've all done something that deserves God's wrath. When we sin, it brings on the wrath of God. Sin is when you go your own way instead of going God's way. We've all sinned, we've all fallen short. But yet instead of showing us wrath, God has showed us mercy. God has shown you kindness. He's been good to you. And not because you deserved it. 
Anything that is good in your life is a gift of God and it is a gift of grace. You didn't deserve anything good in your life. And you know that. You know that. Because you know you. Everybody else here, they just see you on Sundays, maybe on Wednesdays. But you know who you are and you know you deserve nothing good from God. But yet, instead of God showing us, pouring down on us the full weight of His wrath, He showed us the full weight of His kindness. He showed us grace. By definition, grace cannot be earned, and it cannot be bribed or bought. And if it is, it ceases to be grace. You need to realize that you have not earned any of the good things God's given you. Sometimes we feel like that we worked for what we have, don't we? We feel like I done this and I, so I got that. I worked and done this and so I got that. But ultimately that is a gift of God's grace. He graced you to be able to work. He gave you that job. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. God gave it to you. There's nothing wrong with hard work. It's a good thing. But you need to realize that every single thing in your life is a gift of God's grace towards you. You didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. But God gave it to you anyway. Grace is the one idea, the one concept in all of the world religions that separates us. No other religion on the face of the planet talks about this subject of grace. Every religious system other than Christianity is a works-based system. It means that when you do bad, you have to do enough good to outweigh the bad. When you do something bad, you have to work to get back into favor with that deity. You have to work your way into paradise. And if at the end of your life you've done more good than you've done bad, then you get whatever the gift is. But that's not what Christianity says. Christianity says that even if we tried to be good, we couldn't do it. And so God, knowing that, knowing that we could never be good enough, did for us what we could not do for ourselves. God knew that we could never live a life that deserved heaven. And so what He done, He sent His Son to live in our place than to die in our place. And so Jesus lived a perfect life. He did not deserve the punishment for sin, which was death. But He died the death that He did not deserve so that we could have the life that we did not deserve. Jesus came and stood in our place. He gave us what we did not deserve, and that was His grace. He paid our price And we did nothing to deserve it. We just receive it as a gift. That sounds like good news, don't it? That's good news. I believe that some people have a small view of grace. Okay, Some people have a small view of grace. But I believe it comes directly from a small view of sin. Let me explain. There's a belief system uh, inside of Christianity, or at least in the Christian circle, that says that you need God's grace to get saved, but after that you're on your own. That grace gets you in and works keeps you in. That you get grace on the first time, and then the rest of the time it's based on how good you perform. You get in by grace, but you stay in by works. And so you go through life. uh, When you give your life to Christ, He forgives you of your sin. And then it's like He pulls the plug on His grace for you. And then you have to worry about your eternal destination based on whether or not you cuss today. It's out there. But could I tell you this morning that the very same grace that saves you is the same grace that sustains you. 
Grace brings you in and grace keeps you in. You can't stay in on your own. You have to have the grace of God. The grace of God is designed to carry you through this Christian life. It gives you the strength that you need. See, the problem is that many people, they have this box. And it's their sin box. And there's five or ten of the things that they hate the most and they put it in this box. And preachers are the worst for this. They always preach on these five or ten things. And they'll stand in the pulpit and they'll say, these five or ten things will send you to hell. These five, and that, that's all they ever talk about. That's all they ever preach about is three or four or five or ten things that are sin. But friend, could I tell you today that sin is not in a box. Sin is anything that misses the mark of the life of Jesus Christ. It, it literally means... Sin literally means to miss the mark. It's an archery term, and it means that you did not hit the bullseye. You did not hit the bullseye. And so the bullseye is Jesus. Anybody live just like Jesus today? I don't know. I don't know. Friends, you're in sin if you're not just like Jesus. You are sinning if you're not just like Jesus. Jesus. If you wanted to live a life just like Jesus, you would have to follow every single rule and regulation in the entire Bible, Old and New Testament. But not just follow it, but you'd have to follow it with perfect motivation. That means your heart would have to be right when you've done every single thing. It's impossible impossible if sin is missing the mark I don't even know if I've hit the target the whole thing you know what I'm saying I need God's grace I've been a Christian 16 years now I think and I still need God's grace I still need God's grace I need it as much now as I did then God's grace is necessary for our lives. We need God's grace on every day and in every way. We need Him every single moment that goes by. We are in desperate need of God's grace and His mercy in our lives. I am totally and completely relying on God. I have nothing good to bring to God. I have nothing that is of worth to bring to a holy God. Nothing that is worthy. Nothing that is good. Think about it this way. Isaiah 64, 6 says this, that our righteousness is like filthy rags when we compare it to God. So think like this. Think of the most righteous person that you know. The best person that you know. You don't have to know them personally. Just uh, uh, Billy Graham, Mother Teresa, wh whoever it may be. Just the most righteous person. Now think about them on their best day. Their best day. A day like you'll never have. A day way beyond what you could do. That righteousness is as dirty old rags in compared to that which Jesus was. Friend, you will never compare to the holiness and righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so you are in need of God's grace. We will look more like Him at the end of our lives than we do right now. We'll resemble Him more every single day. But we will never reach what Jesus was. And so, for the rest of our life, we will need God's grace. You will never outgrow or outneed God's grace in your life. 2 Corinthians 12 is where I want you to turn in your Bible if you have one this morning. 2 Corinthians 12, and we're going to 
read uh, verse 7 to verse 10. This is Paul talking to the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church was a, a messed up bunch of people. Let me just tell you. Go read 1 Corinthians sometime and tell me that the church at Corinth was not a messed up bunch of people. They had some serious problems. They had so many problems that Paul had to write them twice. He heard about their problems the first time and he wrote and addressed them. They had a whole new set of problems and he had to write them again. So at the end of that second letter in 2 Corinthians 12, uh, 7 to 10, he says this, Paul speaking. He says, So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to, said to me, listen to this, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, I am strong. Paul was struggling against something. He had something in his life, and we don't know what it is because if he had told us it, it we would blur the lines there, but... Is anybody struggling in here with anything? Just You don't have to shout it out or nothing. Just raise your hand. Yeah, we're all struggling. We've all got problems, don't we? See, some of you think that there's something wrong with you because you're struggling. You bump up against that familiar thing and you think something's wrong with me. And there is something wrong with you. But could it be that the struggle that you're having in your life is actually a good sign? Have you thought about that? If you're not struggling against sin, then you're probably just enjoying it. You know what I mean? You didn't struggle with sin before you gave your life to Christ. You just did it. You just ran with it. Whatever you wanted to do, whenever you wanted to do it, if you're not struggling against sin, that is a time when you need to be concerned. Because as long as you're in this flesh suit, you will struggle against sin. You will struggle against hardships. You will, you, there is inside of you, there is an internal struggle going on. Your heart has been changed. Your heart is righteous. Your heart is redeemed. But you are living inside of a sinful body. And until you get out of this sin suit, you will struggle against sin. Your heart doesn't want to sin. Your body doesn't want to do anything but sin. And so it's a struggle on the inside of you. Do you know what I'm talking about this morning? Has anybody felt the struggle? Do you know what I'm talking about? You might even say the struggle's real this morning. There is a struggle going on inside of you, but that's actually a good thing. You need to be struggling on the inside of you against sin. Because it just means that you're try your heart's trying to get you closer to being like Jesus, but your sin suit's just resisting. You will struggle until the day you die. But Paul says something about his struggling. Whatever it was, he prayed three times that the Lord would take it away. Some of you are on about 3,000 times maybe. This is just when Paul was particularly writing about this. Uh, he probably prayed about it more to be honest with you. Some of you may be on uh, 30,000. But anyway... In the midst of him crying out to God. 
and saying, God, I want rid of this thing. I want to get out of this thing. Whatever it is, let me loose from this thing. God says this. My grace is sufficient for you. That's not what Paul wanted to hear. Paul wanted God to say, Okay, you're released. You don't have to struggle anymore. You don't have to fight anymore. That's what Paul wanted God to say. But instead, God says, My grace is sufficient for you. And my power is made perfect in your weakness. Could I just tell you that in the midst of your struggling, in the midst of your hardships, in the midst of the things that you're praying that God would take away, God's just saying through all of that right now, my grace is sufficient for you. Wherever you're at today, whatever you're going through, God's grace is sufficient for you. God's grace is enough for you. What if we believe that as a church? What if we believe that God's grace is enough? You might even say that God's grace is greater than anything in your life. Could I just tell you that God's grace is greater? It's greater than your sin. It's greater than your disappointment. It's greater than your doubt. It's greater than your fear. It's greater than your depression. It's greater than your need. It's greater than your addiction. It's greater than the thing that's holding you. It's greater than your deepest, darkest valley. And it's greater than your highest mountain. God's grace is greater than anything you will face in your life. God's grace is greater than anything you will face in your life. God's grace is greater than anything you will ever face in your life. No matter what you bump up against, no matter what you're struggling against, God's grace is enough for you. And sometimes it won't feel like it's enough. Sometimes it won't feel like He's going to give you grace. Sometimes it won't feel like that you will ever come out of whatever you're in. God's grace is enough for you. God's grace is greater. Let me make this clear this morning before we go any farther. Grace is not a license to sin. But instead it's a license to to run full force to our God who has open arms knowing that if while we're running and we fall and we will He will catch us no matter what. You can run towards God this morning. You can take risks. You can step out in faith knowing that while you're running and when you fall, God's grace will always be there to catch you. Grace is not a license to sin. And when you understand God's grace, I don't think you'll ever want to take advantage of it. When you understand the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross, and when you understand how undeserving that you are, I don't think you'll ever want to take advantage of it. It's too good to take advantage of. You know what I'm saying this morning? Grace will always be there for you. I want to give you three things this morning that it means for us practically as individuals and as a community. Because if we do in fact believe that grace is greater, it ought to change the way we live. Did you know that right believing leads to right living? You can try to change the way people live, but if you don't change the way they believe, you'll never do it. When we believe the right things, it changes the way we live. And so I want to give you some practical application to go along with this. 
as Jesus followers who believe that grace is greater, we don't have to live in the darkness anymore. You don't have to hide your sin. You don't have to hide your shame. You don't have to hide your regret. So many times we come into church and we want to hide everything going on in our life. Right, we do. It's, it's human nature. But when we come in here, we have to realize that God's grace is greater. And that if we want God to look strong in our life, it requires us to look weak. When we look weak, God looks strong. And so we have to decide if we want to look strong or if we want God to look strong. Because we believe grace is greater, we can bring out our struggles into the light. We can be honest about what's going on in our lives, what's going on in our families, what's going on in our marriages. We can be honest with those things because we know that God's grace is sufficient for that situation. That He's going to cover it. That He's going to take care of it. We can bring those things out and we can begin to get healing in the deepest, darkest areas of our life because we all realize we all have problems. And church, your problems may look different than my problems, but we all have problems. And so we can all be real and honest about what's going on in our lives. Let's stop playing games. Let's stop playing like everything's perfect. And let's start being real about our lives. That's one reason that I love small groups. I have a small group over at my house on Monday nights and we come in and sometimes it's kind of long but we can be honest about what's going on in our lives. We can be honest when we run into something uh, in our book that we read or in the scripture we read that week. We can be honest with, I'm not sure about that. I'm struggling with this. I'm not really good at this in my life. We can just be honest with each other. Because we understand that God's grace is enough. We can be real and we can be honest. So, if you don't have a small group, I want to say one more time, you need to be in a small group. The second thing that it means is that we can run towards God without fear of failure. Did you know fear of failure holds us back more than anything else? We are afraid of people seeing us fail. We are scared to death that somebody will know that we failed in some area of our life. And we hide it with everything we can. We don't step out in faith because we're afraid we'll fall. We don't uh, take steps towards God because what if we fall on our face? We don't take risks because what if it don't pan out? We can get past that because grace is greater. I'd rather run towards God and fall than stay where I'm at and stand. And as a church, I would rather us fall on our face, running towards God and pursuing lost people in our community and have to shut down in five years knowing we had reached people than to stay here for the next 50 years and reach nobody. We're not going to be afraid of taking risks. God's grace is good enough for us to step out in faith on. We're going to step out in faith knowing that God's grace is greater than whatever failure we may run into. We can take giant leaps of faith knowing that if we lose our foot, if we fall, if we fail, God's got us. His grace will always catch us. We can take risks. We can go the extra mile and we can step out in faith because grace is greater. The last thing that it means for us practically This is a tough one. Everyone gets second chances. Even the people who hurt you. 
even the people who hurt you. Everybody gets second chances here. No matter what the failure, no matter what they done, no matter what they said, we'll show grace to everybody because we've been shown grace. If God can forgive that person, so can we. So can we. So many times churches are divided by unforgiveness. Not here. We're going to be a community where we love and forgive. And we give second chances and third chances and fourth chances. And we're just going to keep on giving until God quits giving to us. Until God quits giving to us. Maybe you're here this morning and you feel like you've really messed up your life. You really did it this time. Maybe you feel like that there is no hope for you now. It's easy to find yourself in that situation. Life puts us through the ringers and sometimes we feel like there's no hope for us. Maybe you're here and you feel like you could never belong to a church because you're just too messed up. Maybe you're here this morning and you feel like God could never love you today because of the things you've done. Could I tell you that there's another chance for you? There is a second chance and a third chance. No matter where you're at today, no matter what you're going through, grace is greater. There is still hope for you. There is still love for you. We love and we forgive and we give grace and second chances because that's what Jesus would do. And here, Jesus is sinner. And so if Jesus gives grace, we give grace. Maybe you're here today and you've heard about this Amazing gift of grace that we've been talking about, but you know you've never received it. You've never experienced the love and grace of the Savior that we've been talking about today. You can experience that. You can get grace for your life. You can experience forgiveness. You've been, maybe you're on the other end of the track, and maybe you've been working hard. To make God love you. You've been working hard. To make God approve of you. You've been working hard. Just trying to make people think that you're okay. Grace is for you today too. Rest in God's love for you. Rest in the grace that he has for you. He wants. To give you. Grace. Today, the way that we receive this gift of grace is not by earning, doing, or anything like that. It's simply believing the message about Jesus' life, His death, and His resurrection, and confessing Him as Lord of our lives. It's giving over control. It's handing God the keys to our lives. Saying, here you go, God. I've wrecked, tore it up, messed it up, but I'll let you drive. If you want to drive it, I'll let you drive. Today, if you want to receive this gift of grace, here's what you need to do. You need to raise up a white flag of surrender and say, God... I give it to you. I can't do anything with it. But I'll give it to you if you want it. When we confess Jesus as Lord, we're giving Him everything. Holding nothing back. 